All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a wonderful day. It was a wild day for Jerome Powell in the market. Not only did Powell say that September rate cuts are a possibility, he also said that they talked about raising rates at this meeting. You had Meta killing it after hours, which brought up NVIDIA, and then even pre-market NVIDIA, Broadcom, all of the chip stocks, they were up on news that the AI China ban, yeah, they were doing a reverse or that there was going to be exemptions. That news that killed us a couple weeks ago, you pretty much unwound it. The NASDAQ got a rally. Today was good for everything. And then after Powell pretty much saying that rate cuts are on the table for September, everything was looking good. And now it is setting us up for Friday and the non-farm. So we got a lot to talk about. I have a breakdown. I have the keys, the plays, all that good stuff. We even need to really talk about this. Does Jerome Powell see something wrong with the economy. So after today, there's a lot of things we need to talk about. Powell brought up some things, even the Bank of Japan. Oh man, we got to talk bonds. We got to talk Powell, BJ. I even made a bond play. So I have all that, Chad. What I need from you, a thumbs up on the video. Make sure you're subscribed. And if you don't know, we are live Monday through Friday, 30 minutes before open, youtube.com slash the stock market. We will see you there in the morning, baby. Run it. Get a spread, started with a little but it's still reinvesting Fear how I fear, do you feel less a blessing? I just want the lesson, I just want protection I'm up and I'm down, but the sound like progression Mama never plans if he waits for perfection I think it to the down yeah. Yeah. But right off the bat, before we get into the keys This is why I left it up here I think we need to start with this question Following what happened here with Jerome Powell Because he did in fact say today That September is on the table If anything, Powell did a couple of things today He said that September rate cuts are on the table. He did say that they talked about cutting even at this meeting. And then he did say he does not want the jobs market to weaken too much and that he does see real downside risks to the employment market. He brought up a lot of different things here. And this is all now to talk about, well, wait a minute, why is Powell talking about rate cuts? Does that mean that the job is done or does that mean something is wrong with the economy? Really, this is the main question here of the day because now following what we got here today, you have a lot of people saying, oh man, Powell is falling behind the curve. Something is going to snap. He should have cut at this meeting, especially if he's saying that they're talking about it. He is definitely far behind. And then there's other people saying, nope, this is a perfect plan. He's doing it if the curve uninverts and and they're able to execute this before any of those cuts. Maybe this is the soft landing and a job well done. So there's a lot that has gone into this. And I even think Powell is going to talk about an economic shift. That's what he was trying to explain today, saying that if they did end up cutting rates by September, the reason is because things are going back to a pre-pandemic economy and that would warrant them having lower, lower rates and why he doesn't want to see the jobs market weaken too much. So, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, that'll be a recession or soft landing or not. Powell's referring to it as an economic shift. So when it's all said and done, I have it here in big letters. I disagree with this. Uh, so the fact that Powell's trying to say it's an economic shift, I disagree. I think this is the age-old game of chicken between the Fed and a recession after raising and cutting rates. So you guys know where I stand. I'm waiting for the curve to uninvert. I do kind of believe this. If the curve uninverts without a rate cut, then that will be your soft landing. And then the moment they cut rates, though, I do think that will be negative. But Powell is kind of framing this situation. He's even ignoring the election and everything else and saying, well, yeah, if the data is there, the totality of it, he is open for September. Now, here's the thing. The main point about Powell, and we could even get into the keys, he was saying, yeah, I'm down to lower rates, but he did not want you to have a lot of confidence in it, and he was not guaranteeing September. So that being said, if you really want to know what happened today, I think all you got to do is look at the dollar like we were saying yesterday, because not only was there Powell, you also had the Bank of Japan. And what we woke up to, the Bank of Japan was indeed hawkish. They raised rates, and they lowered their tapering amount. The yen started to rocket. The dollar was down, and then even Powell came in. And by the end of Powell, the dollar started to go lower. 
floor. Again, this idea of Powell saying he's ready to move in September, that right there was a little bit more dovish. And that's where we were saying yesterday, well, maybe the Bank of Japan can start moving, especially if they reasonably believe that the Fed is going to start slowing down. So literally, Powell didn't take away from anything from the Bank of Japan tomorrow. And even then, this is something I'll say, we already talked about the main factor with all of it. But if you want to know how to characterize this meeting, was it the most bullish thing in the world? Not really. Was it bearish? I wouldn't say so. Again, Powell concealed some of his rate cutting intentions but you've seen this before while we were doing the rate hikes well now looking for the rate cuts this was the meeting where Powell was talking about talking about rate cuts so if you remember at that one iconic meeting he said we're not even talking about talking about about raising rates or something like that but now it's the reverse here where we're talking those rate cuts because now he was willing to discuss it not hammer at home, but he definitely put it on the table and now kind of leaning more to the data, giving you that nudge like, hey, market, you're on the right track, but not outright handing it to you on a silver platter. So like I'm saying here, definitely a lot of takeaways. I think this is what the market's going to walk away from. And now I think this just leads us into Friday because that's going to be the ultimate powder keg. So I would watch a couple of things. We need to talk about the yen. We're even going to talk about the bonds. But when it comes down to Friday now, I think that's going to be the powder keg with the jobs report. And I remember someone was like, what's a powder keg? Google it. It's like something they hold ammo in or a situation that could become volatile. Yeah, but it's it's going to be explosive on Friday simply because the bonds, the rate cut odds, the Russell, they're already moving in that direction. If something gets solidified, everything else, including those trades, they're just going to keep going off of whatever the data says. If Powell's talking about rate cuts for September, you get good data. That's going to solidify a lot of of things for people if it goes against that and it's like oh well maybe this data is saying Powell is going to probably wait a lot lot longer maybe we start to get bearish again so Friday I think has the most potential for volatility all the other trades they're still on the table and like I said here earlier you did have war tensions this morning or even like later in the day it got in the way we did hear that Iran was gonna or was it Iran yeah it was Iran they said they're gonna retaliate you know due to the Israeli thing yesterday and we've been getting those war tensions in increasing gold oil all of those trades are moving up there too so i think friday mix that in with the global tensions as well as the data and now we have something to really chew off of of whether or not powell feels a certain way about september i think this is going to lay the groundwork until september and then we see what the scp and all of that brings in and then even the earnings because we still got more and then meta wasn't that bad but now uh, let us get into the play. So, uh, right off the bat, I have a couple of different plays. I think I made a play on most of the ones I'm going to share with you here. But the first one is slash ZQ. We talked about this today. We even talked about this earlier in the week. But this is the rate cut odd play. And remember, I brought this up not even too long ago. So, you can learn how to read these and read the bonds. But the thing about this play today is you had Powell. And he talked about his rate cut odds and all of that. I talked about this before. And then right when we had everything there, I decided to play it. Because I was like, well, wait a minute. Right? If you were there on stream, right when he said, then, yeah, September was on the table. I went after all of these plays. And the whole reasoning behind all of that is simply because I was like, all right, I think the market, with all things considered, those are better odds. I just don't like the prices of where they were at. But like we were talking about, Yes, everybody knows they're going to cut the odds in or cut in September. That's where the odds are kind of glued. Yeah, I, I say everybody knows and maybe it still doesn't happen. But fact of the matter is that's consensus. But the whole idea is that's consensus for one cut not how many. So by buying the Fed futures, that was only implying one cut still, even though it was a higher probability. So by buying it, if people did get something they like, if Powell's talking September cuts and all of that, then maybe now people could get a little bit more aggressive there. So I figured those odds may start to move. So that's why I went with that play. That was the ZQ. It went up a little bit. Honestly, it shouldn't have even went up that much. That's why I was like, all right, it's decent. I went with this slash ZQ U24. So I do think Fed futures here, if you start seeing people talk about four, five, six, seven cuts, those are the plays that could still make money. It doesn't matter about the probability because if everyone's stuck on that now and that's not a question of if he's cutting, the next question is going to be how many times those are going to be the plays that are moving around that you could be able to make money on. That is what is open for debate. So watch out for that. That is play number one. Then play number two. 
Oh, man, this one, I went both ways on this for the earnings, and I think it's going to be very crazy tomorrow just with how it's moved. Again, it was at 140. Last time I checked, it was at 120 there. I think it's either going to have a wicked bounce tomorrow, depending on the other earnings and how the market wants to trade after this post Powell reaction, or if they're really going to be the earnings loser. I think they could go 110, even a little lower. Again, chip makers have been very volatile this last couple of weeks, almost responsible for this NASDAQ correction and even some of that bounce we saw today. So watch out how this plays out. I grabbed the 110 puts. I I even think I had the like 190 calls. I like the both ways. I spent like 120 or 130 for this, so not too bad, but I will even look for a follow-up play. We've hit arm before on earnings, and then we've even hit the follow-up, so if this is a 2-3 standard deviation mover, I even think, even if you don't have a play now, watching these in the morning, this could definitely be a good one. So that is play number two, and then finally, YCL and 6J, man. I, I guess last but not least, all of the end plays are back up on the table. I don't have any right now. I had an older future. Again, I took profits on that one and had to roll over, but it was a rollover date, but I didn't roll over. So I'm waiting. I made that flip on it yesterday. I really should have held it, but I am going to be looking for an entry now, especially if we're talking bonds and all that. But after what happened with the Bank of Japan, the actions were solid. If Powell really does cut rates, and if he does do it in September, I think that's going to be more strength or by that time, the yen won't even come down by then, but all in all, I think all the yen plays are back up on the table. I'm looking for my entry, either a big pullback. I don't know. I think there's still a possibility that it'll come back down to where it started just because the yen likes to do that. But if everything goes correctly and the B of J starts getting more hawkish and Powell really pulls back, this may be the point we never look back from here and that's it. But all of those actions fundamentally, things are looking good because if you don't realize what happened with the Bank of Japan, their economic data wasn't calling for them to raise rates, but they still did it today. That's why mix that in with Powell and them moving. Things are starting to look like you're just kind of hitting a systematic plan more or less, and then things might start going one after the next. So all the yen plays back in play. Watch out for those as far as everything else. I did make a couple of plays today. We went out for the MO. That was the earnings. Again, they dropped and their earnings wasn't as good as expected. I don't think it was a bad earnings, but they fell a little bit more than what was priced in. Then they bounced back up, but I decided to go for a dip buy on the MOs. I grabbed the next week, 51 calls for three cents. I bought 50 of them, only 150 bucks. Then they shot up there to six cents, sold 50 of them, got half of my investment or all of my initial investment back, sold half of the options, got 25 options for free. And then those Disney plays from the beginning of the week, I sold seven out of 10 of them for 70 cents. We bought them at like 40. I made those free, so I have like 200 bucks worth left of free options for earnings. Those are for September. Then I did the arm play both ways, spent about like 120. I grabbed the 110 put for next week and then the 190 call, so we're still in those. And then uh, Powell, I made the ZB and ZQ. This is the long end of the curve, and then these are the September futures. Uh, both of those plays went up a little bit, and I'm still riding on those. I'm probably going to cut out of the ZB because I do think the bonds have moved up a lot already, but... All of this stuff from the war fear bid down to Powell, and then we'll see what the data says on Friday. I mean, this is all very supportive of that. And if anything, though, maybe we just sell the news on Friday, and then we could reposition as we get into next week. But that was all that I did today, and we already went over the question. So now, oh, man, you have no idea, Chattadonia. I'm super-duper excited because now we are in Chapter 10, and we are going to be talking about the international monetary system but this is one of my favorite lessons. So I hope if you haven't watched any of these econ videos, you're going to learn something from this chapter. Um, and I'm glad for those of you who have watched all of it because now you have all the background and the framework because now it's funny because we're talking about it with Bank of Japan and everything else going on. We are really going to talk about currencies today. So I have the intro. Then we're going to get into a little teaser, but you should get excited off of it. And then before you know it, we're going to be really diving deep into some of the more economic sides of this and remember we still have like another like 10 12 chapters to go so chatadonia i hope you're ready for all of it but here it is this is chapter 10 
the international monetary system. The sole purpose of the international monetary system is to facilitate international economic exchange. Most countries have national currencies that are not generally accepted as legal payment outside of their borders. You wouldn't get very far, for example, if you try to use dollars to purchase a pint of ale in a London pub. If you want this pint, you have to first exchange your dollars for British pounds. If you're an American car dealer trying to import Volkswagens to your dealership, you will need to find some ways to exchange your dollars for euros. If you're an American trying to purchase shares in a Japanese company, you'll have to find a way to acquire Japanese yen. International transactions are possible only with an inexpensive means of exchanging one national currency for another. The international monetary system's primary function is to provide this mechanism. When the system functions smoothly, international trade and investment can flourish. When the system functions poorly, or when it collapses completely as it did in the early 1930s, international trade and investment grind will whole. The purpose of the international monetary system is simple, but the factors that determine how it works are far more complex. For example, how many dollars it costs in American tourists to buy a British pound, a euro, or a hundred Japanese yen, or any other foreign currency is determined by the sum total of the millions of international transactions that Americans conduct with the rest of the world. Moreover, for the currency prices to remain stable from month to month, the United States somehow must ensure that the value of goods, services, and financial assets that it buys from the rest of the world equals the value of products it sells to the rest of the world. Any imbalance will cause the dollar to gain or lose value in terms of foreign currencies. Although these issues may seem remote, they matter substantially to your well-being. For every time the dollar loses value against foreign currencies, you become poorer. Conversely, you become richer whenever the dollar gains value. That is true whether you travel outside the United States or not. This chapter and the next develop a basic understanding of the international monetary system. This chapter presents a few central economic concepts and examines a bit of post-war exchange rate history. Chapter 11 builds on this base while examining contemporary international monetary arrangements. In the current chapter, we explore one basic question. Why do we live in a world in which currency values fluctuate substantially from week to week rather than in a world of more stable currencies. The answer we propose is that the international monetary system requires governments to choose between currency stability and national economic autonomy. Given the needs to choose, the advanced industrialized countries have elected to allow their currencies to fluctuate in order to retain national autonomy. So I hope this rings a bell because before we started doing any of these lessons. This was one of the first chapters I ever picked out to read you guys. So this is very important, but hopefully you're understanding, again, the change of currency and how you need to use one currency in another place and where does this value derive from? Why do values fluctuate? That's what we're going to talk about. It gave you a little bit. It was saying, you know, again, how trade occurs, that affects the value, whether we buy or sell more goods. That determines whether or not you have a stronger or weaker dollar. And then again, why is it that advanced industrialized economies operate this way? You know, think about it a little bit more of the extra knowledge. You know, we've been talking so far. Why do advanced industrialized countries, why do they opt for certain policies with MNCs and FDI and all of that? Now we're getting into the currency stuff, but even as its own little lesson, you could learn a lot about currencies with this lesson and just understand how the value of currency and trade and how that affects the value of currency. It's one of the most important things things to your money and monetary and business and monetary systems and all of that. So getting into it, the economics of the international monetary system. We begin by examining three concepts that are central to understanding the international monetary system. First, we look at exchange rates and exchange rate systems. We then examine balance of payments and conclude by looking closely at dynamics of balance of payments adjustments. So what you need to understand, exchange rates, balance of payments, and then how balance of payment adjustments work. Those are going to be the three factors. Today, we are only going to go over exchange rates, but over the next couple of days, we're going to go over that. But understanding the whole monetary system, these are your three economic uh, economic concepts or pillars to understand a better idea of it. So getting into exchange rate systems, an exchange rate is the price of one currency in terms of another. As I write this sentence, for example, the dollar yen exchange is 107. Haha. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. That's at like 150 right now, uh, which means that $1 will purchase 107 Japanese yen. So here's my pop quiz to you. If it was the yen, if it's at 150 right now, is it stronger or weaker from when this was written? It's funny because he updated this, but I don't think he updated the yen valuation. But continuing, $1 will purchase 107 Japanese yen. A currency exchange rate is determined in the interaction between the supply and demand for currencies in the foreign exchange market. The market in the world's currencies are traded. When an American business needs yen to pay for goods imported for Japan, for example, it goes to the foreign exchange market and buys them. Thousands of such transactions undertaken by individuals, businesses, and governments each day. Some looking to buy yen and sell dollars and others looking to sell yen and buy dollars. That determines the price of the dollar in terms of yen and the price of all the world's currencies. Imbalances between the supply and demand for currencies in the foreign exchange uh, market cause rates to change. If more people want to buy than sell the yen, for example, the yen will gain value or appreciate. Conversely, if more people want to sell than buy the yen, the yen will lose value or depreciate. So hopefully you're understanding, you know, Forex foreign exchange market, that's literally one of your terms here. This is not a, a weird broker. Ah, it's not like one of those weird online brokers. It has nothing to do with like Forex. It's not like a scam. It's literally like the whole entire market of just changing currencies. And it's based off supply and demand. Again, when you buy a dollar, if you want to change your dollar for a yen, you are literally selling the dollar and buying the yen. If you want to go from yen to dollar, you are selling the yen and buying the dollar. So as people want to buy and sell the currencies, one of the other, depending on which currency they're trading out of, that determines the supply and demand, and then that affects the value of the currency. So that's where it's saying, welcome to, welcome to Forex. But continuing, an exchange rate system is a set of rules governing how much national currencies can appreciate and depreciate in the foreign exchange market. There are two prototypical systems, fixed exchange rate systems and floating exchange rate systems. In fixed exchange rate systems, governments establish a fixed price for their currency in terms of an external standard, such as gold or another country's currencies. Under post-World War II arrangements, for example, the United States fixed the dollar to gold at $35 an ounce. The government thus maintains the fixed price by buying and selling currencies in the foreign exchange market. In order to conduct these transactions, governments hold stock of other countries' currencies as foreign exchange reserves. Thus, if the dollar is selling below its fixed price against the yen in the foreign exchange market, the U.S. government will sell yen that it's holding in its foreign reserves and will purchase dollars. These transactions will reduce the supply of dollars in the foreign exchange market, causing the dollar's value to rise. If the dollar is selling above its fixed price against the yen, the U.S. government will sell sell dollars and purchase yen. These transactions increase the supply of dollars in the foreign exchange market, causing the dollar's value to fall. The yen the United States acquires then becomes part of the foreign exchange reserves. Such government purchases and sales of currencies in the foreign mar foreign exchange market are called foreign exchange market intervention. So that one kind of bundled a couple of things there, but the first one, uh, exchange rate system, it's telling you there's two types, fixed and floating. And when it's fixed, that means you are attaching your value to another currency or another asset. So again, at one point, the United States dollar, we had a fixed exchange rate system. The dollar was backed by gold. That's what it was attached to. But it's also talking at other times, we've even been fixed to other countries. So like we'll have an equal ratio between the dollar and yen. And that's what it was explaining there. And this whole idea where we're saying you buy or sell yen, other countries they hold other countries' currencies. That is called their foreign exchange reserves. And why do they hold that? Because you transact with these other countries. So if you plan on trading or you already trade with another country and you need a kind of fixate a balance, you're going to have foreign exchange reserves with whoever that partner is or if you trade with them a lot. But those are called foreign exchange reserves. So it's packing in a lot there. Fixed exchange rates, exchange rate systems, and foreign exchange reserves. But continuing, in a floating exchange rate system, there are no limits on how much a currency can move in the foreign exchange market. In such systems, governments do not maintain a fixed price for their currencies against gold or any other standard, nor do governments engage in foreign exchange market intervention to influence the value of their currencies. Instead, the value of one currency in terms of another is determined entirely by the activities of private actors, firms, financial 
financial institutions and individuals as they purchase and sell currencies in the foreign exchange market. If private demand for a particular currency in the market falls, that currency depreciates. Conversely, if private demand for a particular currency in the market increases, that currency appreciates. In contrast to a fixed exchange rate system, therefore, a pure floating exchange rate system calls for no government involvement in determining the value of one currency in terms of another. So I hope you will never forget any of these because these are very important lessons, but a fixed exchange rate value is tied. It's fixed to something and then floated, it is floating and freely moving. It's floating around relative to the value of something else. So the value of what it is by being floating, it's never really fixed. So a dollar can change values. There's no. That's why you don't really know what your dollar is worth. It's floated against everything else. It's pretty much based on what it could get you. That's why your CPI is so important because you're like, oh, wow, how much am I paying for the same basket of goods? Because, again, your dollar is floating. Ain't that something? But... That's purely floated. Not everything is a purely floated economy. It's even going to talk about it. Fixed and floating exchange rates represent the two ends of a continuum. Other exchange rate systems lie between these two extremes. In a fixed but adjustable exchange rate system, the system that lay at the center of the post-World War II monetary system in the European Union's regional exchange rate between 79 and 99, currencies are given a fixed exchange rate against some standard and governments are required to maintain this exchange rate. However, governments can change the fixed price occasionally, usually under a set of well-defined circumstances. Other systems lie closer to floating exchange rate end of the continuum, but provide a bit more stability to the exchange rates rather than a pure float. In a managed float, which perhaps most accurately characterizes the current international monetary system, governments do not allow their currencies to float freely. Instead, they intervene in the forex markets to intervene uh, to influence their currency's value against other currencies. However, their there are usually no rules governing when such intervention will occur, and governments do not commit themselves to maintaining a specific fixed price against other currencies or an external standard. Because all exchange rate systems fall somewhere between the two extremes, one can usually distinguish between such systems on the basis of how much exchange rate flexibility or rigidity they, they entail. In the contemporary international system, governments maintain a variety of exchange rate arrangements. Some governments allow their currencies to float. Others, such as most governments in the EU, have opted for rigidly fixed exchange rates. Still others, particularly in the developing world, maintain fixed but adjustable exchange rates. However, the world's most important currency, the dollar, the yen, and the euro, are allowed to float against each other, and monetary authorities in these countries engage in only periodic intervention to influence their value. I'm laughing in Japanese and haha because imagine all we've seen with that right but this is in theory uh, but then again if you really even think about it up until recently we barely even intervened with the yen or the Japanese did it wasn't until this recent fiasco sorry that was my interruption but continuing consequently the contemporary international monetary system is most often described as a system of floating exchange rates we will examine this operation in detail in chapter 11 so again you just need to understand the broad basis of what an exchange rate system is the types of it, understand foreign exchange reserves. Again, fixed and floated, those are kind of the extremes. Everything falls, again, fixed but managed or a managed float. That's kind of what you have right now. And then that's the basic top down. And then we're going to delve into it a little bit more. But further, is one exchange rate system inherently better than the other? Not necessarily. Rather than rate the systems as better or worse, it's more useful to recognize that all exchange rates embody an important trade-off between exchange rate stability on the one hand and domestic economic autonomy on the other. Fixed exchange rates provide exchange rate stability, but they also prevent governments from using monetary policy to manage domestic economic activity. Floating exchange rates allow governments to use monetary policy to manage the domestic economy, but do not provide much exchange rate stability. Whether a fixed or floating exchange rate is better, therefore, depends a lot on the value that governments attach to each side of the trade-off. Fixed exchange rates are better for governments that value exchange rate stability more than domestic autonomy. Floating exchange rates are better for governments that value domestic autonomy more than exchange rate stability. So, this is where a lot of the debate is going to happen. Why do some countries do this and whatnot? But again, as you get into the MNC stuff as well, you're going to hear how every country has developed. But the thing is, this is all my opinion. This is where it gets really important because the value of the dollar, the value of trade, 
like we're going to be discussing. And as it's outlining here, this is how you come up with the value of things, depending on what you trade and how do you determine trade. You need, again, currencies and these values and how they all fluctuate. And this is why fixed and floated, the intervention and all that, these are pretty much the most important things when it comes down to the economy. I'd argue you don't have an economy without any of this stuff. So Chad, we have a lot more to go over. Again, this is one of the OG lessons. I don't know how many of you remember it. Uh, maybe we're going to have to touch base on that one again, but this is getting us into Chapter 10. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you are excited for more Pal in the rest of the week, but... That is your watch list, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure Hydra Healthy ready to go. Make sure post your watch list. Make sure we see you there in the morning. I need the armor on. I need the helmet shining. I need you to remember, baby. You got to stay in the game. Your identity is different than who you are. And if you are going to identify with something, identify with something good. The best version, baby. Think good. Think positive, And that's what y'all get. But Chattadonia, I love you. Drink that water. Stay hydrated, healthy, all that good stuff. I'll see you in the morning. And on. <laughs>